As one of the numbered editions, the Standard H Defender Watchbox serves as a salute to our military as well as a nod to one of my absolute favorite vehicles of all time, the Land Rover Defender. Tireless energy has gone into the transformation of a 50 caliber ammo can into a luxurious product. The box's 8 watch capacity is perfect for those with smaller collections or those traveling with a subset of a larger group. The Defender Watch Box willfully serves as your watch's go-to companion for attending watch meetups or carrying a select arsenal on a trip. Though the name of the watch box derives from a Land Rover, the details stem from more than one vehicle in a true standard age fashion. The inside houses two wooden trays handmade by artisans in Florence, Italy from poplar wood and then elegantly lined in the same Alcantara suede found in GT-level Porsches and 99% of modern supercars. This plush detail is the exact type of accommodation your timepieces deserve. The padded diamond pattern under the box's lid is a nod to the seat designs found in Mercedes G-Wagons as well as the Koenigsegg Agera R. Also inside is a bespoke aluminum owner's plate displaying your name and box number. Included is a certificate of authenticity I personally fill out and hand emboss with a Standard H logo. The subtle shift logo badge on the outside is made from cast white bronze in the age-old lost wax tradition of jewelry making, then antiqued and hand polished. Each Defender watch box is made to order and placed in a wooden crate that I build and paint in my garage, which will no doubt be a fun event for you to open with the included miniature pry bar. Available in three iterations, the watch box comes in signature Standard H Garage Collection Stealth, which is black with gray interior for a sleek modern aesthetic, OD green with cognac interior for a true military look, and omakase where no two purchases are the same. You and I will exchange an email regarding your personal preferences, which will aid in the completion of your Defender watch box and crate as a departure from the normal offering. As an added bonus, 10% of each OD Green purchase is donated to Heart and Armor, which is a foundation focusing on veteran health. As always, thank you so much for supporting Standard H. If you follow Standard H, chances are good you also follow Wei Ko. He's the founder and creator of Revolution, a magazine exploring the world of watches, and The Rake, a traditional menswear magazine that's one of only a handful of magazines I subscribe to. Wei has been very open in interviews, so I strive to ask questions I haven't heard before. Never a disappointment, Wei does a beautiful job combining his signature self-deprecation alongside sincerity, which is one of my favorite abilities of his. We talk about drinking, being a late bloomer, and his understanding of how certain people find success. I ask him how he recommends smaller brands reach a larger audience, and his answer is incredibly insightful. We also go into a bit of car talk and how his lack of interest to play golf is what got him into cycling. Watches, cars, and bikes. To say this man has taste would be a drastic understatement. Wei has served as an incredible inspiration to me, not only through his business ethics, but also by way of his unabashed embrace of being himself. He's a trendsetter and one hell of a writer. Though I had many more questions, Wei was incredibly generous with his time, even as we went longer than he'd scheduled. Without further ado, here's my conversation with the often imitated but never duplicated Wei Ko. I'm your host, Wesley Smith, and you're listening to the Standard Age Podcast. Way. Yes, hi, how are you? Oh man, I'm pumped for this. <laughs> Pleasure. Yeah. I um how much time do you have? I want to be sensitive. Uh, about thirty to forty five minutes. Is that all right? Okay, yeah. I think we could bang this out in that amount of time. You do um you do a lot of interviews, which is awesome. Um so what's the question you're asked most? I guess usually it's a question about how I came up with the rake or with revolution. Right. Okay. So I'm not going to ask those. Uh, <laughs> ben Clymer has referred to you as the international man of mystery. Uh, <laughs> welcome, Waco, to the podcast. I really appreciate your time. It's a pleasure. How are you? I'm doing well. You were born in New York City. When did you last live there? Um, I last lived there. I lived there briefly after I, I finished the army in Singapore. So I went to, I grew up in New York City, you know, but was born and raised there. Um, when I, I guess one of the few people in Manhattan that, that it actually was born and raised there. Right, right. And I went to university in upstate New York and went to Vassar College. Right. And then I went to the um, Singapore military uh, because you have mandatory national service for all men 
right? Right. And then when I came back, I was en route uh, to um, a job in Montana. I got myself a, a job on a cattle ranch in Montana, and I gave myself like um, a couple of weeks off in New York. Nice. So I guess I kind of ostensibly live there. Um, but the funny thing was during that period, um, so there was like this girl that I was in love with in, in, in university, right, or in college, I guess. Uh, and like the first year I, when we were both freshmen, like the moment I saw her, I was like, wow, she's, that's, that's the girl for me, right? She looked like she was stepped out of like a, a J.D. Salinger novel, right? <laughs> which goes to show you where, what my upbringing was like. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, um, we became friends and, you know, I, it was one of those frustrating relationships where over the course of four years, we were just friends, but we were really good friends. Right. And at some point, you know, having been sort of raised on, um, on teenage movies, um, John Hughes movies, right? Like I thought, okay, or, or I, you know, romantic novels. I was like, I, I got to make a declaration of my affection and I'm sure she'll re reciprocate because this is the um, paradigm that I've seen in every film, you know, by John Hughes. <laughs> And, and so, it, funnily, in, I don't know if you know this, but probably you do, like in Pretty in Pink, which, well, I'm not sure if you know this film, but, but the original version of Pretty in Pink, Molly Ringwald's character ends up falling in love with um, Ducky, who's played by John Cryer, who's the lovable geek, right? But apparently audiences were so um, offended by that, right, that they had to reshoot the ending, and so, so she ends up with um, the, the cool guy. Right. right? <laughs> Uh, who was played by Andrew McCarthy, who, funnily enough, um, goes to Soul Cycle in in New York because I see him there from time to time. Oh, so the hilarious. point is that, is that um, tr most audiences want the girl to end up with the cool guy and not the geek. And in this context, that was exactly what happened because as soon as I made this declaration of affection, she gave me the worst answer a woman can give to a man, which was basically, "Oh, um, uh, thank you." Right. <laughs> But, but, you know, you know, and I really love you too as a friend, right? So, but the, so the incredible thing was um, after two and a half, almost three years in the military in Singapore, uh, I was on route to Montana and I remi re remember that she lived in New York. So I, I called, her up, called her up and said, hey, do you wanna, you know, just have a beer? And I didn't have any expectation, you know, just thought it'd be nice to see her. Sure. And, you know, five minutes after we met, we were like making out in some bar, right? And I was so surprised by this, I actually, had brought my friend um, with me and I turned to him and said, Hey, uh, are you, you seeing this happening? Right. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then he just was like, so I'm going to be leaving now. And then, uh, and then I moved into her apartment, I think a day later. Um, and it was kind of the most um, idyllic, you know, kind of romantic uh, two weeks of my life. It's one of those, like, like if, I don't know if anyone um, has ever had this kind of crazy unfulfilled or unrequited love for someone. And then to actually, you know, become a couple with that person. It's like the most extraordinary feeling. You just feel like you've won in life, right? Um, and you know, it was tough because, like, that sets you up, especially if you're very young. Like for the rest of your life, it's 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 a little bit tough um, because you, you you've set set the benchmark so high, right? So we we uh, were together as a couple for quite a few years. I think almost uh, actually longer than my duration in the, in the military, uh, <laughs> going on four years, um, but. Uh, I made the critical error, but you know, you're young at the time. So I went to film school. And then after that, I, I got this um, job in Los Angeles being the assistant to um, a film director named Catherine Bigelow. And like at the time it was like all about career, right? And I made the mistake of like kind of choosing career over um, placing the importance of your relationship uh, first, right? Right. Sorry, that was a very long uh, answer, but there you go. I, I, last time I lived in New York was for two weeks somewhere in the, in the, mid nineties or, or, and it was awesome. Well, I know in high school you had an affinity for men's tailoring and literally dressed your way into clubs and bars, including studio 54. What's your cure for a hangover? Oh, um, I think the only cure for a hangover, I wouldn't say it, it, it eliminates it a hundred percent, but I would say you are able to get back to, I would say 60 to 70%. Right. Just, um, and it's hard to do, but you have to go like, hardcore on your cardio right like you have to go outside in the middle of the day if it's 12 o'clock or wherever you woke up and you have to run but you can't fucking jog right like you've got to like you can jog in the beginning to get like get going but you've got to like basically try to give yourself a heart attack right <laughs> and then the combination of the endorphins and you sweating out all of the toxins 
that'll pretty much get you back straight. Like it'll get you to about, you know, 75, 80%. Right. But I guess the, the tough thing, because, you know, like my country's just entered a second lockdown right now, which like seriously pisses me off because I was supposed to go to Italy next week. Um, and then I was from there, I was going to maybe stick around in Europe, even maybe attend PT Homo. I think it's the one thing that I would caution people about because, you know, I'm Mr. Negroni's, but it's, it's the um, mental dimension of drinking constantly. Right. Because it, it like, sometimes, you know, when I was young, I used to think like, Hey, I, I'm fucking manic depressive, but I, I wasn't, I just drank too much. Right. <laughs> you yeah. know? Um, and so like, it's important to kind of do these resets every once in a while where you step away from the booze and you're just like, okay. Um, I, cause it's, you know, it always starts as like conviviality, at least for me fun. And then sometimes it slides off the slope completely. And, it, and especially in the context of last year, like that can happen so easily, right? Like totally, you know, I'm just going to, you know, I'm trying to structure the week where like three, three, sometimes even four days I don't drink, but last week was just nonstop. Right. And, and it was, and, and so like I had to kind of do a reset over the weekend, which seems to, to work. Yeah, totally. I, um, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I think, uh, I try to follow the rule, like try to drink to celebrate. Don't yes. think like, you know, don't drink to fulfill any other type of, uh, emotion. It's only to, yeah. to, to bring you up as opposed to deal with going down. You know, the, the other thing too is, is, and this is maybe the toughest one for me. It's just like also kind of just don't sport drink. Right. Like, which is basically, I have nothing else to do. I'm just going to get hammered. Right. right? <laughs> which is, especially when, you know, when I guess everyone's kind of out of lockdown now, but when you were in lockdown, that was like every day. A hundred percent. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, you've said that you come from a family of watch lovers. Um, what were some of the watches worn by your family members? So, like um the real watch lover was my grandfather and um cool. he he's like a he's, he was really generous so he he um, gave each of his sons a, a reference 96 um paddock when they were 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 they were, they were young men um beautiful which my brother then just took from my father <laughs> which is ironic because you know i guess i'm the watch guy but it's okay i i have a small but um personally uh collected paddock collection of my own um uh so my grandfather was a watch lover and i think that he kind of encoded into everyone a, um, a value for for mechanical watches and the watch that obviously I, and i've spoken about this before with um, i think it was on ben's um uh, interview uh, that I had when I was young was a watch that my uncle had owned, which was a Rolex Datejust, which my grandfather had owned previous to that. So, and then uh, unfortunately mm -hmm. that was stolen from my father. So, but that, that, you know, really demonstrated to me the, the capacity for an object like a watch to be an heirloom and to go from one life to another life. And I find that very romantic, you know? Totally. No, absolutely. What watch are you wearing right now? Wearing the um, Omega Speedmaster Silver Snoopy 50th anniversary watch. Oh, gorgeous! Awesome. Yeah, you know it's it's. I mean, again, like I you know, I've, I've talked about it before, but I've I've done. I became kind of a Speedmaster guy a little bit later in life, uh, and then I went crazy for them. And I, I, you know, I was fortunate enough to go crazy for them before they went they went nuts in terms of prices. Yeah, like I just looked in Chrono 24 because I was doing a Financial Times. Um, panel discussion with Raina Leishelman, who's the CEO of Omega. And this is one wanted to see what, you know, secondary prices of, of Snoopy's were, and they're like 50,000 US dollars. So it's, it's just gone nuts. You know? Yeah, that's insane. I'm a sucker for alpha hands. So I have the first Omega in space myself, but that's a great watch. I love it. I love it. You mentioned Catherine Bigelow. I, I live in San Diego, based in San Diego. I know you're not a fan, but because you went to film school. Here. I went to film school in San Diego. Yeah, I went to San yeah. Diego University, yeah. Uh, so what part of San Diego do you live in? I live, well, I used to live in Encinitas, which is North County, but now I live in San Diego proper. Like, I, don't, I mean, University Heights, if you're familiar. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so. you know, it's, it's not that I dislike um, San Diego. <laughs> I, I, I really love the fish tacos. Right. Yeah. Rubio's. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Um, and I, and I love the life there in terms of like everyone, you know, has a really very good balance between like enjoying their lives and, and work. Uh, is it balanced? <laughs> and, and, and okay. To be fair, the winter is crazy hot, right? Like just insanely. You'd be like, I don't know what's going on with the genetic gene pool there, but like the women yeah. are just in, insanely good looking. The problem is I grew up in New York. Right. And, and like, I, I kind of like was almost like an Asian Jewish kid in terms of like you know, the neurosis and the, you know, the, the glibness and, and the need to over talk about everything. Right. Uh, I, I guess, you know, cause I was born in Mount Sinai and my, my best friends uh, 
father when I was a little kid was, was a rabbi. So I don't know if that that, <laughs> that kind of, you know, affected me in some way. So if, if you think about it, San Diego is like the, the extreme opposite of that, right? And so, <laughs> yeah, you know, like no one got sarcasm there, you know, so... <laughs> 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 it's so funny because like as as somebody who surfs and has a background in retail, I would ha- my days off would be during the week because retail workers, you work during the weekend and I would constantly be in the surf lineup at, you know, Tuesday on a, you know, at 2 p.m. And the water's packed. And I'm just like, what do you people do for a living? Yes. Like the So the work ethic, although there are a, a few of us with a work ethic here, there's just like this. I don't know this mentality of no. I think I'll just surf today because I think it's because the weather's too nice. You, we have the option, right? You know, so, so there's a great crime novelist uh, called Don Winslow, uh, um, and he wrote a great book called The Gentleman's Hour. Okay, it's it's, it's a great crime story, um, but it's set in San Diego, and it's all about. And he's a detective, but he's a surfer, and it's like <laughs> when he's given the opportunity to detect, he's like. I, I, I know that's my job, but I need to surf. Right. And the gentleman's hour is like, I, I don't know if this is what surfers actually call it, but it's where all the old dudes surf before all the young guys show up, right? Uh, uh, right, cool. right, right. What I wanted to ask you, though, um, was there any lesson or like, did you learn anything either in film school or working for Catherine that you use today? Uh, I, you know, Catherine's an extraordinary um woman and it was a, I mean also an incredible filmmaker I mean she's was the first woman and now you've got a second one Chloe's yeah right? the just this year yeah to, to, to win best director um, and I think she I think what's extraordinary about people who are in that profession and it was probably the reason I couldn't work in that profession is the extraordinary self-belief that they have and the, the the capacity to go through periods where they're just developing ideas right like for me I can't like I need to wake up in the morning and shit needs to happen like I need to be doing stuff like I need to be you know have like tasks that I need to fulfill which then have a result mm. and to kind of just sit around and, and be creative, it's, it's tough, right? Like, I mean, I guess there is some dimension of that as well, because, okay, like, um, right right now I'm working on a 10,000 word article on, on Paddock World Timers. But the thing is, when oh. I'm done with that, it's it's an article and it'll, it'll be published, right? Whereas with films, you, you never know. And as enchanted as I was with filmmaking, um, I realized I didn't have the, the aptitude for, for directing because um, directing is an incredible, incredible skill set because it's like puzzle solving right you're basically taking something in your mind and then you're breaking it down to its component parts and then you're creating those components but always keeping in track this you know what you have in your mind which is i don't have that ability to do and then the ability to also patiently repeat that that action from different angles from different setups from different takes like i'm a very impatient person like everyone who knows will tell you that right and and uh and and I, I just don't have that mental focus and that patience to do that. Mm. So I have so much respect for people that do. I have a very good na- friend named Paul Feig, who uh, directed um, Bridesmaids and the Ghostbusters yeah. in a simple favor. Um, and I, you know, and I think he's a great filmmaker. I also think he's really cool because he kind of defines his own genre, right? So a simple favor is really interesting because it's kind of tongue in cheek, but it's actually genuinely like um, like thrilling at certain points. Um, and he's also an incredibly stylish guy. So I, and whenever I see him like, you know, working like, uh, or I listen to the stories about him on set because he's doing this massive thing for Netflix right now, I'm just blown away by that, that mental discipline. Right, right. Um, it's well documented how you started Revolution in 2005, uh, focusing on the world of watches. However, h- how old were you when you launched the magazine? So I, I'm a really a late bloomer. I was like very lost in life initially. Um, like I had these artistic aspirations, wanted to be a filmmaker, wanted to be a screenwriter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or, or really, <laughs> you know, but you know, the thing is a lot of times, like it's, it's that um, blind devotion to that, 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 that enables people to succeed, right? And there's a lot of people, like look at Billy Bob Thornton, for example, who kind of like are just on the fringes of shit until they hit, right? Like with the way he did with Sling Blade, for example, and then he blew up, right? Totally. Um, so the ability to have that blind faith, it's, it, unless you have that, you'll never succeed in, in, that, in that profession. Um, so yeah, I kind of meandered around a little bit um, and then, then ended up back in Singapore because you know, maybe it's it's um, cogent related to kind of what's happening in America right now, because um, 
like I consider myself probably more American than Singaporean because you know, I grew up there and, or maybe more New Yorker than, than, than anything else. Um, but like, and one of the things that I love about America is also one of the things that is a little bit daunting. Like, so the thing I like about America is like, you're on your own, right? Like, but if you get shit done, that's your success is yours. Right. <clears throat> but that also means that like, it can be a, a land that's quite rugged, right? Like it's probably the land where I've like witnessed the most number of physical confrontations. Like, cause there's like that whole cowboy pioneer mentality where like, hey, let's step out and just settle this with our fist, right? Which is cool. But now everyone has guns, which is not cool, right? So, yeah. <laughs> so like I've been kind of like looking at what's happening right now with the whole, you know, like Asian hate crime thing, which obviously upsets me. Um, and I know that's not the America that I love, right? Like, but but it, you know that does exist to some extent in in the same way that there's anti-Semitism or anti-Islamic sentiment, or you know, of course, everything related to what we saw with with um, with black people last year, uh, and it's ongoing. But um, it was funny because for the majority of my life in the United States, um, I was always kind of like a little bit, found myself from time to time kind of uneasy. And I was trying to figure out why it was because it was almost like this existential malaise, right? And it was only when I came to Singapore that, that I suddenly felt like this burden lifted off of myself. Uh, and it was the feeling of being part of the majority for the first time. Right, right. right. Sure. And like I was, I was like, oh, how come I feel so like, like comfortable like it's easy yes yes yeah so it was a very interesting experience and then you know i was like okay well it also seems like um like a very dynamic place in terms of um of setting up you know business small businesses or entrepreneurialism so i ended up staying here and then uh by the time i got around to it i was in my late 30s right i mean i remember you know uh when when um i was uh, dating my my wife or actually my, my ex-wife, because that's where we're splitting up, but it's very amicable. Um, I remember when I wanted to take her out, I had to look to, in my bank account to see how much money I had in there because I only had a debit card and I didn't want to exceed the threshold of that, right? So like, right. you know, we go to a sushi restaurant where shit would be like on a conveyor belt and you're like, please don't take the red plate. Please don't, please don't take the red plate, you know? <laughs> um, and, and in some extent, you know, you really, uh, those... Those experiences are important, right? Um, but yes, uh, Singapore was, uh, you know, still an amazing place to be. Sure. So that's really interesting. Were you self-published to start? Uh, yeah. Uh, so I mean, I was doing all the uh, sort of supplements for other, you know, uh, magazines, um, which were being published by either large publishing companies or franchises of international publishing companies. Um, and then, yeah, we just uh, figured it out, distribution, figured out um, uh, printing, figured out all of that, uh, and then uh, and then just published ourselves and, and still are. I mean, we're, that's, that's what we do. Yeah, sure, right. sure. We've got some licenses that are being, like, um, published by larger companies, like, you know, publishing conglomerates, but but that's where we are right now. Oh, wonderful. And you started with a partner, correct, or no? Yeah, uh, he's no longer a part of the company, but I started with a, 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 another gentleman. Okay, fair enough. Uh, <laughs> um, how do you see the future of watch media playing out? Like, for example, like what types of mediums? I think that it, it goes beyond the question of medium, but I think okay. it's basically the consolidation is going to happen pretty rapidly. Um, so I think that basically retailers will become, um, publishers, right. Or, mm. or media companies and media companies will become retailers, what I, I think probably the smartest thing that would that could happen. So you got we've obviously seen you know what Ben has achieved with Hodinkee, which is you know incredible, right? right? And then if you look at Mr. Porter, for example, I mean they 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 created an e-commerce company. So like Ben went from um, media to becoming probably the biggest online player in watches right now um, for primary watches, and then then um, Mr. Porter went from like e-commerce to being a media company, right? Um, I think one thing that potentially could happen would be retailers um, and, and media companies consolidating, which would probably mean retailers purchasing the media company, because I think that the market cap of the retailers, especially if it's a bigger group, would be larger than that of, of a media company. Uh, I'm not saying that, you know, I, I'm inviting, you know, large watch um, uh, retail conglomerates to purchase us, but hey, you know, I, I'm always open to any conversation. Um, and then I, I wonder if also... Um, 
there'll be a further consolidation where uh, luxury groups will get involved in that. I think potentially there might be as well. But so then I guess the question is, uh, which everyone's trying to navigate is how do you keep quality um, in editorial uh, with even if you're selling watches? And I think that um, I think it's it's hard to to say, I, I think it's actually pretty much impossible to say, well, it's going to be church and state because it just doesn't exist, right? It's right. like some of the guy from the retail team is going to walk over and be like, dude, you got to fucking push this. Like we, we sell these fucking things and all you're talking about is like, I don't know, feel the fucking DeFores, right? Which are dope, right? But there's only like, you know, 20 of them in the world, right? right? We don't have any of them. So, so I think the way um, forward related to that is just to be true to yourself, to not chase like, you know, crazy growth, but of course everyone wants to grow and in so doing, allowing yourself to just sell the stuff that you really think is dope. Right. Right. You know, because then for like every like genuinely dope watch that you launch and that people are like, wow, that's really well thought out. That's a cool watch. Um, I love that. Or that's a really well selected watch. You're absolutely right. I love that watch. It reinforces your um, perspective i'm sorry you're, you're you're standing as a tastemaker right like like if you i don't know um if you ever went to that shop in paris called colette right like but back in the day i i know exactly the story you're talking about i just i i actually unfortunately never went i was so sad to see them go but yeah i mean that's really sad you know like so colette was exactly that kind of story right um like you would go there and you'd be like wow i'm discovering all of these brands and all of these things are so well selected and all the stories about these things are really cool and it wasn't just a way of um of purchasing things it was a way of like educating yourself and learning and like being broadening your perspective um and you would leave there with more understanding of a certain you know like, like whether it's watches or jewelry or clothing, like a greater understanding or sneakers, a greater understanding of it. And that was fun. Now, it's sad, as you said, as you mentioned that, that they, you know, um, couldn't, cause like that shop would have been perfect for a transition into e-commerce. Right. And there was no one who wouldn't w- want to work with them, but I guess they just, you know, didn't see it coming. So. Yeah. There's nothing sadder, I guess, than something that's like before it's time, you know I mean? It's like, it was ahead of its time rather. Um, the rake was really like, I had suffered from that when we, we, we launched the rake. Cause like, like I would say the, the return to classicism in menswear didn't happen for a year or two afterwards. It was starting to happen. And I remember the first time I showed um, a, ab- a potential advertiser uh, a copy of the rake, they're like, Oh, you've made a magazine about dead people in suits. And I'm like, uh, okay, this is not going to work. Right. I don't know if you can see, but like it, you can't, but from there over are all the rakes that I have. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, I keep them, man. I like them as like reference books almost like they're, they're really these, awesome. I've got, I got shelf space now. So I'm going to um, see if I can dig up like one of every copy and just, you know, stick them all up there. Oh, that'd be awesome. man. If you haven't heard episode one of the Standard Age podcast, then let me tell you about my friend Tim Jackson. As owner of Passion Fine Jewelry, Tim and his team specialize in fine jewelry, as well as some of the finest independent watch brands available. I'm talking about Groenfeld, Habring, Kudoki, Roger Smith, Roman Gauthier, Sarpaneva, the list goes on. The staff at Passion Fine Jewelry is literally made up of friends and family, so you will feel right at home if and when you visit. If California is out of reach, you can absolutely email or call the shop and they'll get you sorted. Visit passionfinejewelry.com for more information. As you all know, I'm a huge fan of using the right product for the right job. And like many of you, I appreciate products with a story. That's why I drive a Volkswagen GTI. It's a hot hatch with heritage. It's also why I'm into specific watches like my Tudor Black Bay. And that's exactly why I'm a fan of the indie accessory brand Contonement. Contonement makes a utilitarian cloth they simply call a kerchief. It's smaller than a standard bandana, but larger than a handkerchief, which makes it ideal to tuck in a back pocket or use as a neckerchief. I always take one on a bike ride or have one with me as a backup face covering. Not only do these kerchiefs satisfy several functions, but they look great too. Each set features illustrations celebrating icons of product design like the Omega Speedmaster, the Fender Stratocaster, or my favorite, of course, a classic GTI. Follow them on Instagram at Contonement Co. That's C A N T O N M E N T C O 
or visit them at contonement.co. And use the code STANDARDH in all caps, no spaces, for 20% off of absolutely everything in their online shop. Now let's get back to the show. You and I actually met at Hodinkee's 10th anniversary very briefly. And yes. um, so that would have made the rake 10 years old, I think, the same year, right? Uh, yes, correct. Yeah, so... That puts you at I'm just th- I'm just guessing you would have been 39, 40 when you started the rake. Uh, yes, I was around there. Actually, you're you're absolutely right. Um, I think uh, I was. Who was way at forty? That's what I'm getting to. Oh, okay. I, I well, I think that I, there was a fundamental insecurity about getting older, and then I you know I figured that the only way to to maybe get over that is to create a magazine that made you uh, about dead people. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, that made you feel more relevant as you got older because at the mm. time, well, I don't know if this is probably still true today because we kind of go in cycles. So I think we went through a decade where we had re-embraced uh, classicism and an older age. And now we're back into a period where if you look at the ads, if you look at the brand ambassadors, it's all about really young people. Right. Right. Uh, and with no disrespect, disrespect to Eddie Slimane, I mean, I remember um, the period where he was at Dior Homme, it was all about, you know, um, waifs and heroin thin people. Uh, I don't know if they actually did heroin, but... Yeah, heroin chic, yeah. Heroin, exactly. And about um, clothes that were so skinny and so tight. Um, and then I was like, well, that that's... <laughs> and that was the coolest thing in fashion. I was like, well, they, clearly that's not going to work for me. And then I started to think about, like, who were the most stylish guys over the course of the, for example, the 20th century. And then it dawned on me that all of those guys, they looked cooler as they got older. Like, like Cary Grant. Like, what's your favorite Cary Grant movie? Yeah, I mean, well, honestly, I don't, I don't have a favorite Cary Grant movie, but I just feel like... And I also don't know, maybe you can answer... Were those actors back then picking their own suits or did they, I mean, they didn't have stylists the way they have stylists now, you know? You know, they probably had costume designers to some degree, but I know like, for example, Cary Grant. Um, so like my favorite movie would be probably The Catch a Thief because, uh, and he's got silver hair in it. He's older. He's like probably right. my age, if not quite a bit older, um, but he's cool, right? Like, uh, and and uh, and so for example, his suit in, in North by Northwest was um, a suit that he had, had made at Kilgar. And then I think that he had actually gone to his tailor in, in Hong Kong because he had like a Hong Kong tailor and made many more of the, the same suit based mm. on that so that he could have multiples of it during the shoot because that suit gets like brutalized, right? But uh, if you look at guys like Astaire, like Astaire, which, I, which is why everyone considers him to be such a beautifully dressed guy, like every single garment he's wearing is something that's his own and he's he has curated or put together every one of those looks. And all those little touches like, you know, him wearing a necktie as a belt, for example, um, those were all just his own, you know, his own, his own things. Right. Although to be fair, like that stuff only works if you're Brett is there. Right. Cause like, well, and he, he had to move in it, you know? Yes, like, exactly. You know, like it's beautiful to see him dancing in clothes. I guess that's why everyone loves top hats so much is because you're seeing him dancing in tails. Right. And it, and it's mm. so magnificent and that like, you know, um, like, uh, that tailcoat, that whole ensemble, that white tie ensemble is probably the, best looking white tie I've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. No, fair. Uh, yeah, definitely fair. Um, what was a big lesson you learned from launching revolution that you brought over to the rake or is it just experience overall? Um, revolution was, is quite, was quite different in that. Like it was, um, it was, it was kind of like pretty much successful from the beginning. Mm-hmm. Right. And that, that the watch market was kind of ready for it and was really interested in that. The rate took a lot more convincing uh, of people. And, and this was in some ways the it, problem with the habit launching it in Singapore, which even though, as I said, I, you know, it's a great country, was not a country that was really that interested in tailoring. Yeah. Nice watch incidentally. Oh, thanks man. <laughs> and, and, uh, or in classic style you know the irony is of course like that's how i guess my probably my grandfather used to dress but it was not really relevant and because it's so warm and so sort of like humid no one was really suiting up here um and and so it only really caught on a couple years later when we kind of moved moved the entire magazine to england right where Mm -hmm. that culture was really alive and well and it was really you know witnessing a resurgence of it at the time right um 
So I guess the lesson was to just be adaptable, right? I guess that's the biggest lesson everyone's learned from last year is, is just to be adaptable, right? You know? Yeah, sure. As Darwin always says, it's not like the strongest or fastest animal that survives is the most adaptable, right? So yeah, we got to be like uh, Bruce Lee says, we have to be like- Flow water. like water. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, I was just about to quote Bruce Lee myself. Oh, that's funny. So you and I have a very similar viewpoint of competition that's somewhat unconventional. Can you share your version of how you see comp uh, competition? Yeah, I mean, it's it's very simple. I, I don't think it's a zero. I mean, the first thing is I don't think anything's a zero sum game. So whether it's um, watches or whether it's clothing or what have you. Mm -hmm. And for me, I, I believe in building communities um, because I feel as if the more communities you build, the more you gain new um, followers or new customers or build that culture. So it becomes more pervasive to an entire generation. Sure. Like if it was just the rake loan talking about tailoring, we'd just be like this kind of quirky menswear magazine that like, like tailoring, right. Um, that was niche. But the fact that, you know, that so many um, people have, you know, emerged both on various different formats, whether it's on Instagram, like someone like uh, Fabio Atanasio, the, the bespoke dude or other like authors um, like Hugo Jacome from the Parisian gentleman, um, mm. like all of these guys together empower a culture. Right. And, and I think that that's, that's great. Um, and then for watches as well, right? There's also, I would say the watch industry I like a lot because it's probably one of the friendliest, right? Like people get on. And yeah. Friends. Like I'm pretty much friends with, with all the guys that I should sort of quote unquote be competitors with. Like when I'm, I'm like on any junket and like say Jack Forrester's there, you know, <laughs> even though he's the head of Hodinkee, we're just going to sit in the corner and get smashed, right? You know? Um, and, and so, and it's fun, right? And, and it's, it's really, it's a really, you know, great moment. Uh, so, um, but I really believe in community building. And I, I guess so do you. Is that what you're yeah. Doing? No, totally. I think all ships rise. You know what I mean? Like, I think it's, it's certainly, um, there, there, there's room and opportunity for everybody to win is how I look at it. Um, I, I'm, I'm not like a, all the chips are mine kind of person. Like yeah. I'd rather kind of spread that wealth. Like one guy that's been, I, I would, I would say, in particularly cool about this is um, Andrew McCutcheon, who founded uh, Time and Tide in Australia. Sure, which is a great uh, watch media company. But he also like was one of these guys that really likes the idea of community as well. Mm. Um, and so we have like an amazing relationship. And I also, you know, was inspired by him because um, he created the the charity for the Australian wildfire, um, which happened. Can you imagine? Only in the beginning of last year. I like, could see yeah. so long. And right. In the context of the beginning of last year, before any of this COVID shit was like, you know, it was like that was the biggest deal in the world. It's like, oh my god, koalas are fucking getting sick, right? <laughs> right. And then, right. And, then, <laughs> and then COVID hit. But his he, you know, it clearly inspired us to do our our COVID solidarity option last year as well, which raised two hundred eighty thousand uh, U.S. dollars for for various COVID charities, in particular, Save the Children and the Red Cross. So yeah, it's incredible. Um... Do you buy watches to mark occasions or does, is your purchasing and acquisition habit just kind of like when it happens, it happens? Uh, not so much to mark occasions. You know, if it happens to coincide with that, um, it's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's more about the individual watch, right? Like, and it's, I guess, as you get older, you, you become, you know, look, I, I, I've also reconciled myself with the fact that I, I will never be a super collector because I just don't have that level of, of, you know, financial, you know, power, right? Join the club. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, and it's also ironic because uh, I guess it's like the people that like know about that shit the most, you know, like can't afford it. <laughs> right. Because we maybe because we have the time to, I, I don't know. I, yeah. This, this, well, this, yeah so, some people do. Like I remember, you know, it was Coco Chanel said that her taste was honed by hunger. Right. Right. And, and, and I, when I got the opportunity to interview Ralph Lauren, he was always like, because, you know, when he grew up, they didn't have a lot of money he had to be very considered about what it is that he wanted to buy. And he would really think about it, which also honed his ability to see one thing as being amazing and one thing that looks almost like it being not as good, which I find very interesting. Right. Yeah, totally. I mean, being able to witness quality immediately, you know, and, and really having that sort of vocabulary and vernacular, um, really important. I don't want to talk about individual watches, but like what does drive you to buy a watch? Like what are the things you look for? Are there any commonalities or? I think that um, I'm looking for watches that have a, you know, as my friend Cyril Veneral, who's the, uh, the CEO of Cartier says a singularity, right? 
So like you could only get it from that brand because that's what they do and that's what they do the best and no one else does that, right? I love it, and yeah. That's kind of indicative of what we see right now in terms of the brands that are successful even throughout COVID. So mm -hmm. why do you buy a Rolex? Because it's the king of sports watches. Why do you buy a Patek? It's because it's a king of complicated watches. Even though the current Patek that everyone wants is not a necessarily a complicated watch, but okay, say it's the king of sports chic watches, right? Because right, um, right. Uh, AP because they make the Royal Oak, right? Uh, Richard Mille because it's like there is no other Richard Mille except for Richard our mill right like and richard mill's even become not even like a watch anymore it's become like like a dream right it's become mm. like the hot, like the like gatsby's like green light that you would see across the, the lake you know that was daisy's house obviously it would be like that that, that uh, unattainable to most kind of dream right, right. and uh, yeah. um and then cartier because it's the king of elegance right they, and that's a singularity so for example um the next watch that I've, I've, I'm, I've ordered uh, is a, a unique execution crash. Um, Incredible. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's dope, you know. It's it's and I'm incredibly <laughs> honored, but I just keep forgetting sometimes that like I gotta pay for this shit, and I'm like, <laughs> how am I how am I gonna do that? But it, it's okay. Is it platinum? Uh, it is in white gold. Um, okay. But it's the first uh, luminous one they've ever made. Wow. Yeah. So wow, that's interesting. What what's the dial color? Uh, so the uh, hands are white. The indexes are white, and the dial is blue. But then uh -huh. in the dark, the hands glow white. The, the indexes glow green, and the dial itself glows blue. It's a Luminova dial. Yeah. Wow, that sounds insane. Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, like I just requested for a luminous crash. Um, and they were the ones who came up with the that idea. So all like respect to the design department in in Cartier. I mean, and they took it to a level that I couldn't have thought of because the, the light, the luminous signature is then a multicolored one. And the nickname that we've we've been giving the watch is um, Starry Night because it's got like the kind of same colors as as Van Gogh's. You know, um, that's one of my favorite of his actually. Yeah, oh, I cool. love that painting. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, so you can imagine, like, so, like, it'll have, like, a kind of, you know, medium uh, blue, which will glow, like, a kind of, like, uh, like a, a cobalt blue. Then, like, it'll have the greens from the indexes and the white from the hands. It's it's a lot, it's pretty much the same colorways as, as, as that painting. Oh, man. Yeah, a favorite for sure. Well, you seem to be really into modern pieces. Do you, I mean, do, how do you split your time thinking about modern versus vintage? Well, the vintage stuff that I want, I, I can't afford. Yeah. Again, join the club. <laughs> no that's, that's why I got this. <laughs> no, no, the, the, um, I mean, I would love to have, you know, um, a 1518, a 2499, uh, a 1463, sure. um, uh, a 1563, uh, split second watch. I would love to have, you know, a 1415, like I would love to have a 2523, but I can't afford any of that shit. Right. Like, uh, <laughs> Like, like, and then I'll, I'll, there'll always be these like unicorns. Like, so there's like, um, so the 1415 is the first produced um, Paddock World Timer, which has got these crazy teardrop lugs. Mm. And then some insane doctor, like in, like, I think 1939, he commissioned a PS Unique World Time chronograph with a pulse meter. And, and there's just one in the world. I'm not sure where it is, but it's like, if you look at that, which, you know, formed like, I guess, the inspiration for Paddock's contemporary World Time chronograph, it's insane. And then what it, what's so cool about it is that he has a pulse meter scale on it, um, but then there's no sub dials. So there's no minute counter, there's no um, uh, continuous second so that you can have the world time dial right. completely clean and uninterrupted. So that chronograph only functions as a pulse meter, right? That's the only function that it has, but he's a doctor. That's what he wanted it for. So he's got a world time watch with a pulse meter on it. And that's amazing. Wow. Yeah. Only one in the world. Clearly I've never heard of it. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, and, and, and so like it's fun to and I think it's important to understand these watches because the more you understand vintage paddock, the more you understand modern paddock. So like, for example, like I lucky enough, enough to have a 5131, which is um, the Quasine Enamel World Timer, which was the last one because the new one's the 5230 uh, and 5231 for the enamel. And, you know, the more research I did on it, the more I appreciated that watch because like the very original um, prototypes for the World Timer were these um, reference 96 HUs. So they were Calatravas in the same way that, that my watch is a Calatrava case. 
Um, but it, uh, and then and then I love the fact that it's got that um, mechanism which started in the 5110, which is a single pusher, where you have um, the out the hand, the disc, and the city ring jump at the same time. Which, you know, the more I found out about it, I realized that actually Louis Cotier um, was working on that already um, before Paddock may put it into production many years later. Um, and, and I think it was probably inspired by what his work in the travel time as well, which is, you know, again, a push button um, travel watch. So that's really cool. And I love um, that my watch has this big round, um, like O shaped, I guess I call it an observatory hand, which is the hand that you see in his early uh, world timers as well, right? Um, I think it's the first one to have it as the, I think it's a 542, but and definitely appears in the 1415. So, so, uh, like the more you learn about old paddock, like the more your modern paddock is like, wow, I really get it, you know? And so that's totally, it's that way in car design too, you know, like it's, it's very similar in, in automotive stuff. Yes. Um, it's, it's interesting. I think that uh, that's, you know, what allows you to really like be creative. I mean, I, I was watching really, uh, uh, I don't know. I, I'm not, I've only started it, so I'm, I don't know if it's going to be good yet, but a documentary on Keith Richards, right? So, and, and Keith Richards is um, in the studio and he's trying to record like a, a blues album. Uh, and then the guys who were, I think it was Tom Waits was saying that his understanding of music in terms of the references, like, you know, is incredible. It's like encyclopedic. It's like so deep. And I think that that's, you know, really kind of the, the pursuit that all of us has. I would imagine it's also your pursuit in, in terms of cars, right? Sure. Yeah, for sure. I want to be sensitive to your time, so I'm trying to, to skip Don't worry this. about it. Um, uh, but you mentioned you're into Speedmasters because I wanted to bring up the Revolution Bar. Yes. So can you talk about like that evolution? Was that planned for a while or was that just kind of like, oh my God, I got this idea. Let's do this. I, I've always liked the idea of um, like, like fun, like knowledge based, like things, right? So, like, I love going to like um, museum tours or I love going to like church tours, right? Yeah. I like going to, um, like, for example, Barcelona and I go to Sagra Familia and I'll take the audio guide or I'll take the, the actual guide, you know, and, and, and I like listening to every single detail about it because I find it fun. But the recurring thing, thought that I had is this would be so much better if they served alcohol, right? Like, <laughs> totally. Right. Like if you could take like a little mini champagne with you, if you're going to a museum tour, it'd be so much more entertaining. Right. Um, and then get a re refill it like every time, you know, like, you know, press a button, someone bring you another mini champagne for, you know, get paid for it, but it's fine. But, you know, yeah. so um, like I was like, oh, it'd be really fun to have a place where you could learn about watches. A few, few uh, cool watches, you know, certainly are limited editions like the, the new show are um, flying tourbillon we launched. But yeah. you could also have a Negroni or a Spritz um, or a glass of wine and chill out or beer um, and, and just relax, right? Um, so that, and unfortunately, we're now in a semi-lockdown, but like that was going really well. Maybe it was going a bit too well because too many people were starting to think of it as just a bar. And I'm like, no, no, you got to chill, right? Um, but uh, yeah, so that was the idea behind it. And then the, the whole Speedmaster thing was, well, you know, I have a personal collection of Speedmasters and, and I, the companies also collected some Speedmasters. Um, there's, you know, it would be nice for people to be able to just actually look at them, touch them, feel them. I mean, I'm not too precious with like older watches as well, because, you know, they're already kind of like patinaed. Right. So, yeah, people like want to come by and they want to look at an Ultraman or they want to look at like um, uh, a 1966 uh, 14512 uh, Central Blot where there's like that additional bevel or, or what have you. They're, they're there, you know. That's awesome, man. That's super cool. Given you've started two magazines, what advice would you have for small brands trying to reach a broader audience? Oh, uh, that's a tough one. I guess, again, you know, the, I guess the question you should ask yourself first is, do you have a singularity, right? Like, mm. like that's the thing with like both of those magazines. And I guess revolution has become less so in that when I, we first started, it was like very, um, like it was kind of rock and roll, but very technical at the same time, right? So yeah. it was like provocative, um, but like you got had super credibility in terms of like uh, watches, right? I mean, sure. sure. And then with the rake, it's like there was no other men's classic elegance magazine around. So I think that before you you start a brand, right, you should ask yourself, am I doing something that no one else does? And can I do it better? Right. Um, I guess that's, you know, with all the brands that I respect, especially someone like, like for example, Ralph Lauren. Right. You know, um, it's funny because, you know, a lot of those styles are, are styles that existed in history, but no one had consolidated them, given them like a voice in the way that he had. Right. And, mm. and made them 
somehow like it's funny because it's it, what he says is true like you'll look at a fair isle sweater or you, like you know a, an original one or you look at a tweed hacking jacket like an original you know one um and they're not as like somehow sexy as the ones that he's created because right. his eye is that of almost like a filmmaker right and he's created like the best and most sort of like um you know idealistic version of that uh, and and i think that that's what was so that's so unique about his clothes and that's why i feel his clothes are like they're almost like symbolic of optimism so i would yeah. say for any small brand like ask yourself like what is it that you do and, and can and, and is are you doing something unique right um i guess what jean-claude biber always says you know first different and unique and then I guess from beyond that, then like, how do you make you know yourself known to the world? Um, well, I guess there's a lot more opportunity today because of social media, right? right there's right. been a lot of like, you know, micro brands and even watch brands. I'll give you an example um, for Lan Mari, right? Like those guys com completely blew up this year and they correctly understood that people love vintage watches and everyone wants to have a Patek 1463, a, a Tassi Tondi, but no one can afford one, right? Or especially like a really, really nice one. So they just basically made it like um, uh, incredibly like faithful um, uh, 1463 with every kind of nuance to it. And then, then you know, also because it's so nice looking, they could put a Mecca Quartz movement into it and no one really cared because it's also like a couple, you know, $400, $500, right? Right. Um, Baltic also, like Baltic, I think is one of those amazing success stories. And they're, they're only, Etienne's only getting better, actually. Like I've seen the stuff that he's going to launch later this year and it's insanely good. And then also we're doing a collaboration with him at the end of the year too. Um, and I have to say, he just knocked it out of the park, right? So um, those guys are, are amazing. And then I guess from a clothing perspective, like I look at guys like, you know, Barbanera, right? Like Sergio and Sebastiano, there's no one else like them. Those two guys are like, like rock and roll, like, like sartorial rock stars, right? Well, actually mm -hmm. Sergio was a rock star, you know? And they're like so cool looking, um, they're so elegant, but like they're covered in tattoos. And what, like, I think Sergio's like the freaking Italian, like jujitsu uh, champion in his weight category, right? Like, uh, so and they're so they love like and they're and they're really nice guys. So what they do is unique. Um, we launched recently a collaboration with Lorenzo Schifanelli, right. um, and you know we'd like to think that, that that's unique as well because also like Schifanelli, but as a tailor, as a bespoke tailor, because it's like basically you know haute couture it's expensive right i mean from an absolute it's a value if, if you if that's if you're that kind of customer like i don't i don't consider it well i don't have a ton of that stuff but like I, you know I'm, I'm quite selective and when i when i make something but then i'll use it forever so you know that's better than buying a balenciaga parka or a poncho <laughs> which you know okay fine you, I, I never would but, but you know what i'm saying right <laughs> uh, so yeah yeah totally so yeah, there's a singularity I think to every one of those brands. Um, but tell, okay, tell me a bit about the brand that you're going to be launching. Well, okay, so Standard H is an automotive inspired line of apparel, but really it's about travel and then you know just the lifestyle of the brand. So um, I've sort of used architecture as symbolism for the structure of the garment, for example. Right. So the shirts that I just launched, these pocket tees. Um, they're like a 20 singles cotton. So there's a little bit more substantial. Um, but then again, um, we, we could talk about business ethics and things like that, but I was also focusing on shrinking a carbon footprint as well, which even though there's a tiny bit of irony, given that I'm automotive inspired, but I want to also look out for the environment as well. Uh, really it's coming from a perspective of balance. Right. And so yeah. that's, that's kind of the ethos behind the brand, um, of just doing things, the right way and also if they can be made in the u.s with a very small carbon footprint wonderful nice. Nice. um so, so yeah yeah I don't, the feedback's been wonderful and i've worked very i've done four fit samples uh as opposed to like one or two they're gusseted so i i borrowed that from actually an ice climbing jacket nice. so that when you load the overhead compartment we've all been on one side of that equation where the dude's belly's just in your face you know, I, it just, I wanted to alleviate that as well. So, uh, you know, just like little things like that, which are good for travel and like your passport fits perfectly in this pocket. Oh, nice. So just super convenient. Uh, your sunglasses will fit in a way that if you bend over to pick something up, they're not falling out. And I hate hanging sunglasses from my neck. It just looks like shit. Plus it's, they fall out. Um, yes. so I've, I've thought about a bunch of different aspects, uh, to the shirts, but, um, 
What keeps you motivated? Uh, I don't think I'm, I'm not satisfied with what I've achieved. So, um, mm. so I feel like there's another, um, dimension to what it need, what I, I want to do. Um, I guess I, when I, I get to that point, then I'll, I'll know. And, and then I, I can relax a little bit, but I guess the one lesson that I've learned is that it's not about achieving the goals. It's about um, appreciating and being fully committed to the journey that we all take. Right. And there, that journey is fraught with lots of ups and downs. Like there's moments where, you know, it's, it sucks. And there's moments that are exhilarating, right? And you have to learn to appreciate them both. And the ones that suck invariably make you a better person. Totally. Oh, that's wonderful. I know you're a cyclist. Is that a dogma behind you? Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's not the current gener- generation one, but it's a uh, it's a it's an F- uh, colored um, dogma. That's insane, dude. That's gorgeous. Thanks, man. And then uh, I'm, I'm up here. I've got a Pegaretti, which was one oh of yeah. Ones that Dario made. Yeah. I have a buddy that ordered one in like 2009 that Dario painted for him. It's incredible. Those things are amazing. It's got a um, nice paint scheme on there as well. Those are like Van Gogh's in and of themselves. Um, so what got you into cycling? It's funny. I guess it's kind of like you either get into golf or you get into cycling. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't, I don't like golf. No, it, it's, I guess it's one of those um, things that you do because, you know, it's, it's a social thing, right? Right. What's well, funny, it's a social thing, but it's also a super competitive thing, right? Totally. Even in, with yourself, like you can compete against yourself like as well. Exactly. Um, and it's, I guess for people who like to buy shit, it's like one of the best sports. <laughs> it's endless. Although what you realize also is because it's endless, it's really dangerous because uh, like, you get to a point where, you know, you're trying to make your bike lighter, for example, and it's right. so expensive for the few grams that you can save, right? A thousand dollars a pound, I think it is. Yeah, I have this uh, <laughs> experiment that I made where I have um, a stork fast scenario, you know, the one with like the integrated brakes um, into the, 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 the fork and into the, the, the seat stays. And then it's got um, a, a pair of uh, lightweight Obermeyers on there, right? And so the, the whole thing weighs like nothing, but it was just to get there was, was, was painful. And then of course it's really glitchy because it's like so light, you know, there's oh, all right. shit wrong with it. So I don't know. Um, but it, I guess you, <laughs> you enjoy that process, right? You like to kind of like configure things in your mind and, and like, you know, check out what the, the, the projected weights will be. And, and if you like stuff like that, I suppose it's fine. It's some, for someone who's a, like a geeked out on details, I suppose, because cyclists really are geeks, right? hundred percent. You're not geeked out on like your bike and you're geeked out on your, 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 you know, anaerobic threshold or your, your <laughs> max or whatever. Right. Um, so, but it, yeah. And then, uh, then it ended up being a, a very um, good sport also for meeting um, all the people that I work with. So for example, my business partner for the rake is uh, one of my old cycling buddies. Uh, the guy who owns the resort in the Maldives where we're opening up our first shop is also someone I used to cycle with. Um, Mike Tay, who, who owns the hourglass in Singapore, you know, well, he was oh, really, really cool. good when he was cycling, but, um, he, he was something that we used to cycle with as well. So. Oh, that's awesome. I had no idea Mike Tay rode. That's great. Um, you know, in Singapore in the, in the, um, the, in well, it's the, the amateur world championships. No. Whoa. That's yeah. That's big leagues. Holy smokes. Well, what I love about you is you're not a car guy, but you've owned like some sick cars, like a 930 Porsche. Like, <laughs> yeah, that was my my first. Uh, well, no, I, I the, my first car was a, a 1970 and a half a Camaro um, SS 350, which was lime green. Which actually, I would love to own, like maybe the Z28 version of that later in life, just because it reminds me of my my childhood. And it, and actually, that's the car that that girlfriend I told you about. She and I kind of drove around America in that car, which was cool, right? Oh, that's amazing. And it's such like an uh, American thing to do, right? Like, right. Um, you know, <laughs> totally. Being a muscle car drive, just drive randomly driving around, yeah, and driving down to Mexico, right? So then, uh, um, then yeah, I had a, the seventy nine nine thirty turbo, which, which was like that's such a dope car, which is so unfun to drive, right? right. <laughs> It's like sucks from an air conditioning perspective, right? You know, because it's air cooled and it just you, there's when you turn on the air conditioning, nothing fucking happens. Right. It sucks from a um, like a, a danger perspective because of the turbo boost, right? And how it's biased, all those rear weights on the back. So it, it, as soon as you lift your foot off the throttle, you just spin around. 
Um, it's a rough riding car, but it's cool, right? It's, it's, I mean, I'd love to have another one, to, but I wouldn't want to drive it as my primary vehicle, right? Right. And then I have like a fun car, but it's bad. It makes me feel bad because of the carbon footprint because uh, I have um, the old naturally aspirated C63 here in Singapore. Oh, sweet. Well, it's also like I was thinking because I, I really love my Mini Cooper. So the car I had before this was a, um, a John Cooper Works Mini Cooper. And that would be a much better car for me to have on every level from a, um, a carbon emission, even from just like a, a cost perspective, because it was so because you get taxed here based on the, the size of your engine. And unfortunately, 6.3 liters, you get charged, you tax a fuckload of money. Right. And like those cars are so expensive in Singapore. I looked at like the price of a new one. of, of And I was just like, I, I like it's, you know, it would be a stretch. Right. And then that means no watches. So fuck that. Right. You know? <laughs> Right. So, so, uh, so, but that's, that's so, yeah, it's, but I have to say it's a super fun car. Um, it makes an amazing sound. It's got a titanium acropovic exhaust in it. Uh, oh, sweet. Yeah. It's, it's super fun. Cool. Well, we're wrapping up here. Um, what's the last thing you did for the very first time? Uh, got divorced. Oh no, man. Come on. <laughs> that can't be the answer. <laughs> Good point. Um, <laughs> The, okay, the last thing I did for the very first time was uh, <laughs> I, uh, I guess I, I helped to start a charitable initiative that raised money for a good cause. And so we're going to continue with that this year. Um, we're going to do our second charity auction uh, this year. Um, it's called the Pink Dial Project. So it's, oh. it's not just me uh, or Revolution and the Rake. It's also um, Eric Koo uh, from 10 Past 10. Uh, yeah. It's um, the incredible RJ Brewer from uh, Fratello. Um, it is, uh, also Eleanor Picciotto from the eye of jewelry. And of course, Andrew McCutcheon from time and tide. And, and we have spoken to watch brands and asked them to give us, um, a PS unique, uh, with a pink dial because pink is the color of uh, breast cancer awareness. Sure. And yep. so we're going to auction them in October, which is the month of for breast cancer awareness, um, online, uh, and give hundred percent of the proceeds to breast cancer charities around the world. But the amazing thing is brands have been so kind, like, you know, they, like Panerai's made this incredible ro uh, red gold Panerai uh, duet with like a pink mother pearl dial. And then uh, some people have gone the opposite way and made like really macho watches with like, like uh, pink dials as well. So we did a, a really cool collaboration with Zenith, uh, last year, which we, you know, brought back the A3818 or the cover girl, and they're doing a, a pink to Heil, uh, grade five titanium with a grade five titanium ladder bracelet, like cover girl for that auction, which is insane. Oh, that's sick. Oh man. Yeah, that's amazing. After that one. It'll be cool. Did buggy life start because you were always running late? Or how did the riding on golf carts to your gate begin exactly? They, they started to provide me buggies because they were just unsure of my sobriety and <laughs> were worried I would not make it to my gate and, oh, oh, you know, not only on time, but make it there at all. And so they just began sticking me on the buggies. Okay. Before I forget, I want to talk about the Negroni and the spritz time. And so, oh, thank you. So what, what, I mean, obviously you're a big fan of Negronis as am I, I, I'm pretty sure the Aperol Spritz is like the drink of my marriage. Like that's <laughs> that's what we share every week. Uh, nice. How did those two come up? I think it was um, very interesting over the course of last year where like, because we couldn't actually meet each other, we started to make, you know, Negronis and share them on social media or all sure. sorts of share them on social media. And I think those two drinks kind of became symbols of like unity and optimism and kind of hope uh, mm -hmm. when we can kind of reconnect again. And like, yeah, I thought it'd be kind of cool to celebrate that with this pair of watches. Um, so yeah, we're, we're really stoked that, that Bell and Ross made them with us. They made a great pair of, of, of watches in terms of um, how the dials look like they're almost liquid. You know, we sold them the Grony watch a, a while back and I think there's two or three spritz watches as of today left. The color is perfect. Yeah, thanks, man. Well, you know, we drank a lot of spritzes and uh, and and to compare them uh, and get inspired. To... Oh, that's incredible! You've mentioned you've writing. You're in the middle of writing two different books, right? Yeah, so I'm working on a paddock book, um, uh, which is on chronographs, perpetual calendar chronographs, and perpetual calendars, right? Um, but I kind of get distracted by this world time story, but I'll get back on that at some point. And then um, yeah, I'm working on potential, well, potentially a book on Ralph Lauren. Um, amazing. But why, the thing is, because I, I know like, for example, Adam Flusser did uh, this amazing book on Ralph Lauren. Yeah, I have it. 
Yeah, right. But I, mine would be more like based on the kind of four interviews I've done with him, these kind of extraordinary life lessons you extrapolate from this guy who I think was like the most courageous um, uh, and kind of woke person before woke, woke was a thing, right? Like his underlying ethics are incredible, you know? Um, <laughs> I think when when uh, uh, David Lauren was like, well, what kind of book is it like? And I think I made the mistake of saying something like, it's kind of like the Tao of Pooh, right? <laughs> Which is... <laughs> Which is how I'm like, Winnie the Pooh is a Taoist master, which I kind of, I was like, okay, that was a stupid example. Um, but I haven't gotten the green light for Ralph. Like I, like I could write that book in like in two days, right? But like, I want to get like the green, like the seal of approval from the man himself. Right. Uh, if not, then I, I can't, I don't feel like that would be correct to pursue that book. Um, and then the last thing is I'm working on a, a, a book on watch collecting um, with, with Mike Tay from the Hourglass. Oh, very cool. Awesome. Well, listen, man, is there anything else you wanted to promote or talk about? Uh, well, maybe just briefly that, uh, yeah, so we launched uh, last Friday our, our first grand complication. Um, we, so we launched a uh, tourbillon, so a Chopard LUC a flying tourbillon. That's right, the Chopard, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty dope watch in that it's the only cost-certified Geneva SEAL um, flying tourbillon, automatic flying tourbillon in the world. And I like it because it's 36.5 mm by 8.2 mm in, in, in height. And I feel as if, well, we've all been talking about the watch world swinging back towards more classic dimensions. Uh, and when I say classic dimensions for a dress watch, I mean anywhere between you know 34 and 37, right? And I think um, uh, it's been an incredible honor and pleasure to work with with Chopard, and in particular, um, its uh, co-CEO Carl Friedrich uh, Schweifler. Um, and it's kind of a celebration of 25 years of incredible achievement um, for Chopard LUC. So, yeah. Sure. Uh, it's a dope watch. Come and check it out. If you if you're based in Singapore, you can even come and and, um, and check it out in person at, at the bar, especially once this stupid lockdown's over, which I believe is on June 13th. Right? Yeah, that's crazy. And what more can you say about Chopard? I mean, what an incredible brand that is, and in, you know, automotive history, etc. You know, the Mille Miglia, and it's it's amazing. Um, well, Way, thank you so much for taking the time, man. I was really looking forward to this one. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. Um, yeah, love, man, love it's good to see you. And, uh, and congratulations to the business, man. Oh, thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Way. Have a great day. All right. I'll catch you on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> okay, see ya. Major thanks goes out to Way for interrupting his incredibly busy schedule. And thanks to all of you for listening. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the show. And while you're there, if you don't mind rating and even leaving a short review, it helps way more than you think. Please give Standard H a follow on Instagram at Standard H underscore, as well as the podcast page at Standard H underscore podcast. Shout out to Jensen Reed and Super Beautiful for the theme track, as well as the clear audio for the noise canceling headphones. Stay tuned for the next episode of the Standard Age podcast in two weeks' time. Thanks again for listening. <laughs>